Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you this long weekend. You were the ones that were too poor uh, and needed to stay here. Lovely to be with you. We come to the last fishing story. I really hope that you've enjoyed the series. I believe that last week, Johan did a little bit of boasting about the size of fishes. Uh, really good to be with you. Uh, I'm going to read to you a story, a story between Jesus and Peter, describes that encounter. Listen carefully for God's word. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, and it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. And so they went out and they got into the, the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, Jesus always calls us friends, friends. Haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciple followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it. Please notice all the details. Please notice all the details. There was a fire of burning coals there and a fish on it, and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the net you have just caught. And so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, and he dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. Fishermen always know how many fish they've caught. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come, come, come have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew, they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and he did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time. And he said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you, we and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. And someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then Jesus said to him, and these were the words that Jesus 
had spoken three years earlier, Jesus said to him, follow me. And so we thank God so much for that story and we pray that God will speak to us today through it. Amen. When I was in grade, grade 10, I had to change schools. I'm not going to tell you today why I needed to change schools because it's a bit of an embarrassment to me. But I went from a very Lani school in Port Elizabeth to a not so Lani school, a school on the other side of the railroad tracks. And just to give you a sense of the school that I went to, um, in grade eight, you would have about 200 learners. Uh, in grade nine, about 150. In grade 10, it would drop to about 75. In grade 11, it would drop even more to about 30. And then there were usually about 10 of us that made grade 12. So it was a very small matric class. The one nice thing about it was that we all became prefects. <laughs> there were only 12 of us. We all got our colors for rugby. We all got our colors for cricket. We all were in the first team swimming team. We were all in the debating society, whether you could debate or not. There were only 12 of us. And we also all had to act in the school play. And I remember it was in my grade 12 year that I found myself introverted, shy, having to act <laughs> for the first time in my life on a stage. I remember, I can still remember, the night before we had the first, the first act uh, I can still remember having a dream, and it must be the typical, typical actor's dream or actress's dream. I, this was the dream. I was on the stage, and curtains were open, and I didn't know my lines. I didn't know my lines. And somehow that dream has always stayed with me always stayed with me. It's become a little bit of a parable for me about life. Would you agree? We're on the stage. This is our moment of life, you and I. We are never, ever going to get this moment again. Never. Never. The curtains are open. And the big question, I think, for all of us is whether we know our lines. Whether we can speak our lines. Whether we can live our lines. Whether we can become our lines. It must be the greatest tragedy of all to come to the end of one's life to realize, I didn't speak my lines. I didn't speak my lines. I begin like that because when we meet Peter, right at the beginning of the story, Peter, Peter knows what it's like not to speak your lines. He knows what, it, what it's like to make a mess. Three years early, let me just quickly give you some background. Three years earlier, Jesus had called him. Do you remember Jesus had said, come with me, I will make you fishers of men, fishers of women. Do you remember that moment? I preached about it. You've forgotten, I know. I preached about it two weeks ago and how Jesus called Peter for the first time and gave him a new passion for people. And Peter went with Jesus. And if you read about Peter's story in John chapter 13, Peter says to Jesus, Jesus, you know, I will, if, you, if you have to die, I will die with you. I will die with you. And in John chapter 18, you will know that's when the wheels of Peter's life came off. You will remember that moment, do you, when he denies Jesus. Five chapters earlier, I will die with you. Five chapters later, I don't know this man. 
Three times he denies Jesus. And you will know that when Jesus was crucified, there is no mention of Peter. He's nowhere to be seen. And you can imagine him struggling with his shame and his guilt and his failure and his embarrassment. That's how the story begins. That's where Peter is. But that's not how the story ends. Did you notice how the story ends? The story ends with Peter rearing to go again. The story ends with Peter having been restored in his commission again to be Jesus' disciple. That's how the story ends. It starts with him having messed up his lines. It ends with him ready to go. New beginnings, new start. What lies in between? What lies in between? And what lies in between is an encounter between Jesus, the resurrected one, and Peter. And all I want to do, friends, this morning, all I want to do is I want us to step into this encounter between Jesus and Peter. And if we can keep one foot in the the Bible, one foot, and if we can keep our other foot in our own lives right now, if we can keep one foot in the Bible, one foot in Johannesburg, maybe you and I today can also have a resurrection encounter with Christ. And that's my prayer. That's my prayer. So I'm going to ask you to come with me now. We're going to step into the story. I want you to notice just a few things, very very few simple things. And I want us to pray all the time that somehow God will speak to us right where we are today. First thing I want you to notice. Will you notice that Peter represents every human being who's made a mess of their life? He represents you and he represents me. I often say to people, you know, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who've made a mess of their lives and those who don't know that. We've all made a mess. We've all made a mess. We've all tripped up over our lines. Yes, we know God has a unique calling for our life. We know that. God wants us to become a unique kind of human being. God has unique tasks for you and for me to do while we're on the stage of life. But how often do we mess up those lines? Peter messed up, we mess up. And I think we mess up for different reasons. I was thinking about this yesterday, trying to think of all the different reasons we, we don't say our lines well. I think one of the big reasons is we often try to be like someone else. God calls me to be Trevor and I try to be someone else. And, we, and I mess up my lines. I don't speak my lines. I think sometimes we mess up our lines when we don't develop those special talents, competencies, gifts, abilities that have been buried in our lives. We neglect them. They've been given to us, given to develop, given to share, and they lie there buried in our lives till we die sometimes. We don't speak our lines. I think sometimes we just live so fast, we never even stop to wonder whether God has got a unique calling in our life. I want to say, friends, this morning, God has a unique calling for every one of us. Every one of us. I think the biggest reason we mess up our lines, the biggest reason is that we, we don't live in a relationship with God and we never get to discover 
what God's purposes are for this one life, this one life. When our kids were growing up, I would just say to them, one life, one life. You've got one life. Peter represents every one of us, every one of us. I want you to notice now, this is the second thing I want you to notice. I want you to notice this encounter between Jesus and Peter, and it's made up of a whole lot of different ingredients. And I want to take you to the text, and I want to show you when John, the gospel writer, tells a story, pay attention to every detail. He doesn't waste a word doesn't waste a word. And I want you to notice, and this is the first ingredient, I want you to notice how John describes Jesus' coming to Peter. He describes it beautifully. Just look at this, just look at this. Early in the morning, early in the morning, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. Whenever Christ comes to us, does this make sense? He brings a new day. He brings a new day. The sun rises with Christ in our lives. He brings a new beginning. He brings new creation. Early in the morning, early in the morning, you see, Peter had gone back to his old life. He had, gone, he had gone back to fishing. And in this beautiful moment, there is Peter gone back to his old life, filled with shame, regret, embarrassment, failure. Early, as the sun comes up, Jesus stands. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. That Christ is the one who brings a new day, a new day. Especially in those moments when we are filled with a sense of failure and regret and embarrassment. Christ encounters us early in the morning, early in the morning. Beautiful little detail of the story. But look at this, look at the, here's another detail. Here's another detail. It'll come up on the screen. I hope it will come up on the screen. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus has got a meal. (laughs) That when Jesus meets Peter, he doesn't take him to a prayer meeting. He takes him for breakfast. (laughs) Takes him for breakfast. What a beautiful picture of friendship. That's why I wrote a book on the friendship of God. Jesus always calls us friendship. We've made a mess of our lives. He he makes a meal for us. He invites us to breakfast. He invites us to breakfast. What a beautiful, beautiful symbol of offered friendship. Especially when we feel that we have failed terribly, terribly. That's where his grace finds us. That's why I love that song we sang earlier. Your grace finds me. Your grace finds me. Wherever I am, your grace finds me and offers me, offers me friendship and offers me friendship. But there's another ingredient in this encounter between Jesus and Peter that's so important for us to, so important for us to notice. Jesus Jesus comes to Peter as the sun comes up. He offers him breakfast. And then what does he do? He take, he, he, I can almost imagine this. He takes Peter for a walk and he helps Peter to face the truth of of his life, of what he's done so that he can start again. And Jesus does this so gently, but so firmly. Did you notice what that fire was made of? What was that fire made of? Do you remember, I asked you to notice it. What was it made of? It was made of burning coals, charcoal. What is the one moment in the gospel when you 
come across coal, charcoal. Do you remember the other moment? It was when Peter denied Jesus. It was by a charcoal fire. And it's almost as if Jesus is wanting Peter to face up to what he's done, not to duck and dive. And then three times, did you notice that? Three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Why does he ask him three times? Why? Three times Peter had denied Jesus. It's almost as if Jesus is helping Peter. Peter, if if you're gonna go forward, if we're gonna go forward, you've gotta face up to what you've done. Gotta face up to that. Gotta face up to the mess. Sometimes we can only move forward when we face the mess. I remember the first time, and I might have shared this once before with you, I remember the very first time I went for counseling, I was 30 years of age, and the wheels came off for me. They just came off emotionally. I found myself plunged into a time of terrible despair and darkness. And I found my way to a wonderful, wonderful doctor, psychiatrist. He was from Witz Medical School. I never forget my first interview with him. I can still remember it. He was a very gentle man, but a very firm man. And I sat with him for one and a half hours and I told him my story and I shared and I cried and I told him my story. And then at the end of our time together, he asked me a question. You know what he asked me? What haven't you told me yet, Trevor? What haven't you told me yet? Somehow he knew intuitively that I was dodging some some part of my history. I found myself speaking about events that happened when I was five years of age, six years of age, seven years of age, that I'd never, ever spoken about to any human being. And as I spoke, beginning to find new freedom, it was just the beginning of a journey, new freedom into a new day. And I think that's always been a picture for me of what Christ does. He takes us, he takes us by the hand. He takes us with grace and he says, let's face truth. And as we face the truth of our mess, he says, okay, let's go into the future. And it's out of that kind of deep encounter with the living Christ that we begin to find a future for our lives. But notice one last thing. One last thing. Notice how Peter gets given again a new commission. (laughs) And he gets invited into a new commitment of his life. Don't you find it moving? He has failed terribly. He's blown it. He's made a mess. And then Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. In Eastern English, Jesus is saying to him, Peter, I've still got a job of work for you to do. I know you've made a mess. I know you've blown it, but I still have faith in you. And for me, friends, and I want to just be honest, for me, to really have faith, it's not so much how much faith I've got in God. We just need a mustard seed of that. To have faith really is to know that God has faith in us. No matter what we've done, His grace finds us. And he invites us into a new future and recommissions us. I've still got work for you to do. Still, I, I still believe in you. And maybe someone here today just needs to hear that. Just needs to hear God saying to you in the deepest place of your heart, I still believe in you. I know that you've made a mess. I still believe in you. I, and I've got a job of work for you to do. And then the story ends. <laughs> 
and Jesus calls Peter to a new commitment. And he speaks to Peter the same words he spoke three years earlier. He says, follow me, Peter. Follow me. And I want to end on that note. Christ invites us today. Christ stands in our midst in his risen presence. And he says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Trust me. Learn to put into practice the things I've said. Come and follow me, and I will lead you. I will lead you into the purposes, that the unique purposes that God has for your life. That's what Christ does. He, le he, he leads us into the truth of our lives. And as I follow Jesus, I discover what I was created for. I discover my lines, I can speak my lines, I can live my lines, I can become my lines. Christ leads me into that. That's why we follow him. I've often said to you, there was a man who had a deep influence on my life, a professor of philosophy, Dallas Willard, a very wise, brilliant man. I never had an argument with him because if I had an argument with him, he would convince me that I didn't exist. So I stayed away from arguments. Brilliant mind. Spent his whole life in a philosophy department. Those of you who've been to university will know that's where the skeptics hang out. And for over 40 years, in a hostile, hostile environment, he lived out his faith in Jesus Christ. And one day a young student, doctoral student, PhD, said to him, asked him, Dr. Willard, you're a smart man. Why do you follow Jesus? Why do you follow Jesus? Now a philosopher answers a question, how? With a, with a question. And so this young man said to Dallas, why do, you, why do you follow Jesus? And Dallas responded with a respectful question. Who else do you have in mind? Who else do you have in mind? Put the alternatives out there. Let's have a look at the alternatives. Who else came into this world, lived like Christ did, died like Christ did, rose again like Christ? Who else is there? Who else? And he stands today in front of each one of our messed up lives. And he invites us into a new commitment. Today, today, let me end. It's an incredible story, huh? Incredible. It's all about new creation. Jesus, as the sun comes up, new creation. Then there's a new celebration. Come and have breakfast. Then there's a new commission. Feed my sheep. And then there is a new commitment. Follow me. And today it's my privilege to invite you into that new creation, that new celebration, that new commission, that new commitment for your life and for my life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, risen from the dead, conqueror over sin, evil, death, present here today, in your word, come to us. Come to each one of us in the midst of our messed up lives. Come to each one of us as we stand on the stage of our lives and we don't know our words. Come to us. Help us to hear your call. Give us mustard seed faith to follow you, to stick close to you, to trust you with our lives. 
that we may allow you to lead us into those unique, into those unique things that God wants us to do, to become the unique person that God wants us to become. Help us to respond. This is our prayer, and we offer it to you with all the love and all the longing of our hearts. We say together as God's people, amen, and may the joy of the risen Christ be with you. God bless you, friends. Amen.